Yeah. It really was. Mm-hmm. He was uh, – he got along down there really well, and I think he fell in love with that place just as much as I have. Nice. How, how, was, how is our truck doing? What's that? How is our truck doing? It's doing. It's doing. Excellent. I got a couple good. more pictures of it, but it's nothing different than what I had before. So I got a good feeling about some of the ground that that guy covers down there. We uh, – and so does Emilio. I mean, we 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 got one half day off in the clinic, and we went and visited another village about an hour and a half away. And my God, that's rough and tumble, <laughs> rough and tumble. So next year, I, if I keep up my Spanish lessons, I may have enough in me to stay up there for a couple of weeks at the clinic just to go visit all the villages. Wow, cool. So we'll see. What how kind of truck is that again? Uh, that was a Mazda, wasn't it, guys? It was a diesel truck, anyway. Okay. It's Mazda. Decades ago, I was over in, yeah, Tanzania, over in Africa. You see a bunch of Toyotas because they beat the crap out of them on probably similar roads. (laughs) We did this run between Dar es Salaam and Oringa in this ancient Toyota Land Rover, and the guy was named Moses, the driver was, and he could have been the original. He looked that old. And <laughs> the truck just about matched, but they, they beat the crap out of him out there. <laughs> I did get around to a presentation. We came up to one spot, something that never happened to us before, uh, getting in there. And our choice mm-hmm. was to go through it or spend another eight or 12 hours to go around it. Um, we hit a, a spot where there's so much extra water that there was two and a half feet of water over the road. There's no current, wow. so we tr- we shut the trucks off, and the locos pushed us through for it was about a hundred feet through it. Uh, wow. We got to the other side and turned them back on for they I think it was forty Q a truck, which is about forty Q is about uh, let me think about five or six dollars a truck. <laughs> hey, That's well money. worth it. Very good money. So you say you're going to learn some uh, off-road riding techniques now? Is that me? Yeah, you. You're the one on the dirt roads. I know quite a few off-road techniques with a truck now. (laughs) (laughs) They're applicable to a bike. Actually, I did run in one of the – I was over by Tikal. I ran into a guy who was doing a cross-country tour there uh, on a – Great looking bike. This is a KML or something like that brand. It was a really nice looking bike. I got a photo of it somewhere. You KTM. ride the one down there, Gary? Yeah, probably a KTM. That could be it. Gary, it uh, you ride at all when you're down there? No, I did not. Hey, you know what, Blair? I was down in Antigua for three weeks this time. And I did not run into one of your compatriots down there at all this time. That's weird. Yeah. That's really weird. I'm normally running into – when I go down there, I you know, I have like one hour off and I'll run into somebody that Blair knows. Yeah. <laughs> Typically. <laughs> Typically. They're all hiding. So, John, how, how many weeks out are you from your knee replacement? Uh, I had it done two weeks ago. You have to do the and, other one? Uh, two weeks ago today, I could barely hobble around using a walker. And now I'm moving around pretty well, sort of assisted by a cane. How long before you're capable of riding a gold wing? Uh, no, I'd rather ride a, a, a motorcycle. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh-oh. I'm getting the evil eye from Chris. Uh, there you go. And, no, they said it'll be probably a couple months before I get back on a bike. I, I timed this. Exactly, non-writing season. Uh, they took off the waterproof band-aid today. The scar looks pretty ugly, but the doc says it, you know, it looks fine. John, what's uh, non-writing season? It's well, <laughs> if you're me and you're a wimp, it's wow. <laughs> We've got jokes. Sorry. <laughs> I grew yeah. up in Minnesota. I remember it. Hmm. Well, I tell you what, this is a tough crowd. <laughs> we need our speaker to show up. <laughs> Missing uh, in action, huh? Huh? Who's our speaker Missing tonight, Linda? Our name's Diana Edwards. She's from Rotary International. She's going to come talk about membership. 
You got a phone number for her? Wait, my might. Let me try calling her. She probably got on sauce and got off real quickly. <laughs> might be. I think that happened right when you joined, Harold. Uh, no, that would be John. She took one look and listened to John and said, nope, I'm done. I That's know. cold. <laughs> Chris, where are you hanging out today? That's just cold, Harold. <laughs> well, you Jerry. can't run and can't catch me. I'm so. going to call her. Talk I'm amongst her. Jerry, did you ask me something? Yeah, where are you hanging out today? I'm in my home in Concord. Concord, Mass? Concord, Concord, North Carolina. Did, did you get oh. uh, anything from that weather system that moved through? We got about five, six inches. Oh. oh. Most, of it, most of it's already gone. It stayed up in North Carolina. Yeah, we and ironically, we got about an inch and a half the morning after. So. We had yeah, you guys out. taking a look at those uh, those maps from back back east there, North Carolina. Um, I think we had some NC stuff, and there was Tennessee and so on. Linda posted some links. My buddy's out there, and the route going between the Dragon and um, and Townsend, and some of the other little shortcuts too. A good turnout here, everybody but the speaker. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jerry, you can tell us about your exploits. Yeah. <laughs> it was, that was amazing. Quite the trip it was, really was. I learned a lot more about eye doctoring. I have, uh, we ended they didn't up. Let you practice. They didn't let what? you practice anything, did they? Well, I've been practicing look, down there for five years. So. <laughs> What's Tom doing? Are you into cataract replacements now, Jerry? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hunting a cataract doctor right now. I may have found a couple. Of them. I got a surprise. One of the links I had to was uh, Senator Rand Paul. How many people knew he was an ophthalmologist? Mm -hmm. I did. Not know That's that. Not. I did not know that at all. Anyway, he's wow. and he does uh, eye mission trips in Guatemala to a, a uh, Lions Hospital there, which is something else I didn't know that the Lions had a hospital there. Oh, it's quite a few hours from where my thing is at, but there's a possibility I can get people in there to get their eyes fixed there. Cool. Good dude. And I did track one guy that's willing to go at a moment's notice. His the other thing I learned in this process is there's different equipments out there that these guys use, and if they don't have the same equipment they're used to, then it's kind of hard for them to do the, the surgery. I didn't know there was different equipments to do those surgeries, but whatever. So it's a little more complicated, but we'll see what happens. The uh, first time we had 38 people that need um, cataract surgery, then last week I saw 190 people, and there's about another 24 of them that need cataract surgery. And for, Jerry, what's your role? Ow. Like, do you do there for them? What am I? I'm I'm primarily an optician at the time when I'm there. So, um, do, doing what? Well, I well, if I'm there by myself, I've got a uh, I've got a uh, what do they call it? An auto refractor. When you guys go into the eye doctor, the very first thing the machine they sit you down to nowadays is an auto refractor, which gets a good first cut as to what your uh, your prescription should be. Mm -hmm. And then not everybody sees the same, even though your eyes are measured one way or another. Then the second thing you do, well, I mean, besides the eye pressure test and things like that, um, one of the other things they do is they put a foropter in front of you, and a foropter is the thing that says, is this one better or is this one better? Is this one better or is this right. one better? We've got yeah. three of those that are portable now. Um, they, I purchased one on behalf of our club. So we, there, our club name is on one of them. That's going to get some good pictures. I got some good pictures of it in use in, um, in Guatemala. It's going to get used again in, in Africa. And uh, between that, you can narrow it down really fast in the glasses. 
And we had 1,200 pair of used prescription glasses that we took in there that we bought from the Lions Club. Uh, Lions Foundation in Wisconsin, they were already sorted for us and already had prescriptions on them and stuff. And, and we sorted through those. And I was, we were able to match 95% of people to the glasses, to wow. what they could see and, and work for them. Um, a number of people you can fix just by uh, giving them um, um, meter glasses. There's a number of these people mm -hmm. who won't wear glasses even if you give it to them, you know, for their prescription, but they only really wanted it for at night when they're trying to read or do stuff close work <clears throat> out in the fields, they're not going to wear the glasses anyway. And <clears throat> pardon me, we took in well, right at a thousand pair of sunglasses. And that's the primary thing you can do to protect people against uh, cataracts and another disease called pterygium. Uh, both these t diseases are easy to get uh, when you're in the high altitudes. Cataracts are a damage type uh, thing to our eyes. Most of the time we get cataracts as we get older from all the sun damage we've had collectively over our years of life. And oh. it's worse when you're higher altitudes than it is at lower altitudes. I've had cataracts developing for 10 years, but I may never have to have surgery. Um, really? The, uh, it just depends on that. And the number one thing you can do is get the sunglasses, particularly up there. They're outdoors in an agrarian society and they're outdoors up mostly out their lives and they're up high in altitude and they'll get cataracts quite early. I saw a number of people with them in their forties and fifties. Um, the ones that really bothered me is there's two girls, there's actually five women, women that had them that were under 40 years of old. Two of them were girls. One was 15 and one was uh, 18 years of age. The one with 15 probably had the worst cataracts of everybody I saw. Wow. And cataracts are from damage. She's a 15-year-old uh, mother, wife. Okay. Wow. What? And you see that a lot, too. And the 15-year-old is... Uh, and she's from a, most of these people are very happy, easygoing people, um, making the short story long. We actually have three different uh, kinds of Mayans that come into our clinic, uh, if you will. We serve primarily Kanabal, and of the 12,000 people we see, probably 11,000 speak Kanabal or, and are from the Kanabal people. They're very easygoing, fun-loving, happy people. Uh, the smallest group of people we see are the Chu. We have one village of Chu, and the Chu are more of a uh, machoistic society. They're they're not very happy people. They're and it's just like one village come in. And this young lady happens to be a Chu, and she said no, oh, she didn't have any accents or anything like that. And I'm like, yeah, sure. And after about a half hour, she came back through and said her sister beat her up two years ago. Hmm. Uh, I don't think so. I think it's more of a spousal boost thing, but there's nothing we knew about that. But, but nevertheless, she has cataracts in both eyes because of that. Jeez. So that's damage to eyes can, you know, get hit by something or something oh. that cause you to have cataracts. Wow. It's correcting that lens replacement or what's the, what's yeah, the surgery for cataracts? The, the lens is clouded and generally what they do is replace the lens and they'll replace one eye uh, generally, it's one eye at a time anyway, but it's difficult to arrange a surgery. Right. Where we're able to do it when we do it is a hospital that's about eight hours away. And they'll have to go spend a couple days there as, as they get the surgery, and then they check on it a couple days later before they can go home. I've had so, both eyes done for cataracts. It's a fairly simple procedure. Yeah. It doesn't take very long. We'd yeah. have both eyes, and we'd probably have a day or two between them or something here, but... Down there, it's limited. I mean, we get everything donated, so they'll get enough lenses for they can either fix two eyes on 30 people or one eye on 60 people. So they'll do one eye on 60 people. That's what they generally Makes do sense. when that happens. When, when we have uh, cataract surgery, <clears throat> when I went in, I thought I'd just have one done, but it made such a difference that I uh, went back and had the other one done. Yeah. I have an excellent friend who within the past month had the same experience. He went and had one done thinking that was it. And within a, a week, he decided to have the other one done. So they do make a big difference in the way you see things. They're developing really new cataracts. Our cataract replacement lenses now 
Uh, the new ones that are available are quite expensive, but they're becoming more and more flexible. And you can actually get your lenses replaced and never even need reading glasses afterwards. Wow. Yeah, that's a big problem. Huh. Right now, they've got progressive lenses that people are putting in in cataracts. But the new flexible ones are starting to come out. So it's back to when we were younger and our, our actual lenses were flexible to be able to focus. Wow. Yeah, it's kind of neat stuff that's going on. The, the, they're getting expensive, too. I mean, the, the replacement progressive lenses are somewhere around $3,000 for a pair of them, above the cost of what insurance pays. It's probably worth it if it's something you never have to touch again. Yeah. But anyway, it's pretty fascinating. Jerry, remind me, do you have prior training in optometry, or what's your what's your other specialty? <laughs> I went down there. Actually, I got tricked into going to Guatemala. Um, <laughs> about oh, over the last, I don't know, 20 years, there's been an eye, or a, uh, a pediatrician and his wife that have been going down there, and they've been making presentations around our district quite a bit. It's, it's, uh, they've done both pediatrician work, and uh, they do a lot of uh, literacy work, and they do a lot of uh, uh, midwife training they've done over the years. And I've set up a lot of their presentations for them to different rotary clubs here by, by doing their computer work for them and getting that set up for them. They're not really a computer. One, about 10 years ago, there was a, uh, they had a group of Guatemalan medical people in here on what used to be the group study exchange program. And they had an open afternoon. They called me if I'd be willing to have them over in my office and talk about something called telemedicine. I said, gee, what's that? <laughs> and they said, oh, that's like using Skype with uh, the local village health promoters to be connected to the doctor here so that they can communicate. I said, oh, okay, we can fake that. And we faked it for about an hour or a couple hours in my office. Had a grand old time. And two, two weeks later, they, or two years later, the lady comes back to me and she goes, Jerry, we got your money for your project. I said, what money and what project? Turns out they had put together and got a bunch of money to put in a satellite connection system with the clinic that's down there. And they asked me if I was going to come and install it. And I ended up coming down and installing that five years ago. Fell in love with the people and fell in love with the place. An opening came cool. on the team the next year because somebody had backed out. So I got to go down and be the med tech which meant I was going to do the way the babies do the urine samples and crowd control. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. found that they had a brand new auto refractor that has never been used and they've never been able to get an eye doctor down there. And so about an hour and a half wow. later, they that thing figured out. And so I've been doing eye doctor stuff since. And this year I've been on a couple of eye missions before. And so this year I went to Africa earlier in the year and learned more about what I was supposed to be doing. And, mm -hmm. uh, cool thing with eyes is, you know, you, you can't hurt them as long as you know some very basic things. You can't hurt the people. You can only help. And so uh, I learned a bunch more about using for opters and stuff. And we had a real mission set up this time, which Emilio went on with me. And we did a, we did 350 people. And then I did another mm -hmm. 180 people on my own last week. And uh, we have another mission going to be set up like next August down there again. This time we're going to bring a bunch of student doctors with us. So cool. that's a cool way to get into something that would otherwise take a lot of formal training. Yeah. Um, so actually, in Africa, we got six eye doctors uh, going, and they still might me have have me on the frockers as well because the eye doctors need to do the more critical stuff. The the cataracts, glaucoma, and issuing the meds. That's something I stay away from. I can identify cataracts. That's about it. Yeah, somebody at our club's asking me if I was in, in the spring, and uh, it all depends on time with the trip, but it sounds fascinating. What is the documentation of the trip? I mean, I saw you post, did you keep a journal and such? Um, we actually, this last trip, had a, a professional with us doing video and photo documentation. He's putting together a full thing of which I'm going to actually do a, put a road trip together to to document on that. I had, uh, besides donations from you guys in our own club, I had somewhere around $6,000 of donations 
from various Rotary clubs that collected together run this first mission. And um, we actually ended up, the eye doctor came with me, got through Alcon another $25,000 of eye meds that Alcon gave us. So it was pretty successful, but I now owe a few presentations. So I'll do one for our club as well as soon as I get the collective stuff together. Yeah, you'll need to come to North I look Carolina forward to and it. do one. Beg your pardon? Say so you'll need to come to North Carolina and do one. <laughs> that might be your range too. <laughs> if, if you get out to Oakland, I'm sure that we'd love to have you as a speaker at the Oakland Club too. They um, Actually, Emilio's club gave us uh, $2,000, I think, which is pretty amazing. So, good stuff. Good stuff. Indeed. So that was the immediate thing. Hey, Jerry. Yeah. You mentioned that, um, you know, there were 30 some odd people the first time and, and it sounds like that number just jumped up exponentially. Uh, you know, is there any kind of advertisement? How's this information gotten out to the local population? Oh, we've got, we've got 40 villages that we work with and each village has their own health promoter right. in the village. Wow. That's kind of the way they're set up there. And yeah. so we let them know that we're going to be there. And, and, and then the numbers pop. Okay. This very first trip was somewhat experimental and we limit the number of people based on the, the eye professionals we have that can, can see them. Generally with a, uh, an eye doctor with a full support team can see about 50 people a day on one of these mission trips. And uh, a student can see about 30, okay, when they, once they get going. So this time we had one full eye doctor. We had a student uh, ophthalmologist doctor and me. So we were the three. And so we purposely told them no more than 120 people a day. And so that was the limit. So they let out the word and got a, got a, a list together of people for us to see through certain villages that were there on this first go around. So we were about a couple of seeing just over 400, 450 people. We actually saw 350. And wow. so if we'd have let it out to the entire 40 and let them know what we were doing and let them know that we had sunglasses for everybody, we'd have seen well over a thousand people. In contrast, wow. that same thing was supposed to limit. We had three full eye doctors in, in Africa last year. We told them no more than 150 people a day, period. Right. We had over a thousand people a day show up to those four clinics that we had over there. Wow. Wow. We had to turn away. We actually ended up doing like 225 well above the limit of what we had. And we ended up having to turn away over 800 people a day and it, the crowds got bigger each day. And that's rough. That is really rough to turn people away. Uh, sure. The third day was at a completely different site from where we were the first day. We got over there, things were going really smooth. This is in Africa, and I'm talking about last January. Really smooth, we had a good crowd we were working with. There's still gonna be too many people. The leftover people from the other day showed up an hour into the clinic, and we had a little fight going on for a while because they were and it was, it was a hassle. So, so do you get cooperation from the local, the, uh, say the local police or the government? Well, or? that one was in cooperation with the local government and the local government decided he was going to say whatever he wanted to say for his electorates. And he learned the otherwise now. So we have a whole different, we're going back to the same area again and they're supposed to have things all controlled a little different. This time we've got six eye doctors coming. So we'll be able to see 300 people a day. How do you These determine who, who do you treat and who, who, who you turn away? We treat them in order as they show up. So we do, we do, we do some uh, acuity testing up front. There's things we do to decide whether or not people have to go any further. Uh, we talk to some of the people about what they're looking for, what their interests are. Some people only need reader glasses. We can process them through like, you can't believe real fast. Um, so I'm on, normally I'm on the, when I'm on a full fledged fishing, I'm either on the acuities, which is the very first thing that you look at and get their 2020 vision, what have you or I'm at the very tail end when I'm distributing uh, distributing glasses. It's 
it's a matter when you use when you use glass. It's a matter of mathematics as to which ones you can overpower, and how far off you can go from their prescriptions to get them to work and and be useful for them. And so that's usually where I'm working. There's about six stations in between the two. Plus, I can do things with the kids. Kids are kids are a lot easier to work with because their eyes are very symmetric. Even even when they need glasses, it's typically they have the very same uh, prescription in both eyes. It's when they're in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, and they have different prescriptions. It's that's where it gets harder. Oh. Well, I didn't mean to be the program today. What's up? <laughs> hey, here you are. What's that, Linda? Our program didn't show, so you're it. <laughs> and much appreciated. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, I'd want it to be a better program for you than what I just did just now. Uh, it's been fascinating. I've really enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I got to tell so, you, I, uh, most of the best things in my life is stuff I've backed into and just been willing to to try. And uh, I thought about, you know, whether or not it'd be worthwhile to go back to school now and be in, become an eye doctor. And, you know, that's three years at, at best three, maybe four years. And that's not just not going to happen. So, um, Why is that um, three you know, I would say if you get the chance to do anything like this one time in your life, the biggest worry you got is to love it far more than the one time in your life. This was what I had in mind after being governor was to do one of these trips a year at a different place in a different world. Yes. Is. is this our speaker? There she is. Hi, Diana. Hi, guys. <laughs> okay, All right. Wait, I see somebody on a motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> motorcycle club. Well, I kind of figured being the spirit of things. <laughs> the rest of us are very, very jealous of Scott. <laughs> I've got a spare bike out here in Oakland, you know. Jerry, I think your talk would be great at our club, and, you know, i got a Triumph or the Orca I can put you on. <laughs> are, are you inviting me out for a ride? Hell yeah. Not in oh. Oakland. <laughs> no. Next time it snows here, I'm coming to see you, Scott. Very good. I'm actually going to take you all for a ride right now. I'm going to leave this thing running while I drive home. So you're going to see some stuff in the background, but let me know. I mean, if, uh, Linda, go ahead and kill my sound if it gets to be uh, too much background noise. Okay. Probably will anyway. <laughs> well, Linda, I see the floor. If you want to introduce our speaker, we go from there. Sure. Well, I want to introduce Diane Edwards. She is from Rotary International in the membership department. And I'll let her, that's all I know about her. <laughs> I learned about her through Adina who spoke last month, but I'll let her introduce herself and she's got a PowerPoint. And if you move your cursor down to the bottom of the screen, there's a green share. Okay, so I'll get, I'll bring the presentation up. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, cool. I'm gonna mute myself. To get double education today. All right. Can you guys see the screen? The PowerPoint? Yes, yes we can. can. Okay, great. I can see it. Awesome. All right. Okay. All right. So thank you guys for having me on this actual call. Um, and I did get your information from Athena. So I'm glad, Linda, thanks for reaching out to me to uh, just talk with you guys a little bit briefly. So again, my name is Diana Edwards. I am the regional membership officer. Um, for zones 24 and 32, and I cover um, the Northeast regions and some parts of Canada. Um, so tonight we're just going to talk about developing strategies for attracting prospective members. Um, we'll talk about different club flexibility types, um, and then we'll just discuss some of the resources that we have available um, to you guys throughout this process. 
So during this presentation, I'd like for you guys to think about the challenges and successes your club has had in attracting prospective members, like ways in which you could use or have already used and the resources that um, we're going to cover, like what have you guys done in the past, and then just to talk about the flexibility that you guys have possibly used in the past as well. So what are actual prospective members? So in your community, in addition to your friends, um, neighbors, business acquaintances, maybe other groups that could be a good fit for many clubs, for example, consider non-member volunteers who have participated in like your past service projects. Those are definitely good people um, that could be prospective members. Um, those who have maybe possibly indicated an interest in your club, but never actually joined. Um, you have those former members who may have left your club or maybe another club in a different area. Um, members who tend to often leave, we find out that a short period of time they'll return if they're actually asked. Um, I'm not sure, but I'm hoping that you guys are aware of the membership leads that come through um, the, from your district level down to the club. Are you guys aware of that? As far as like the club leaders that's on the line? I am. Okay, great. Diana, uh, just so you know, we were just chartered this summer and we're a pretty unique club. Oh, uh, really? No, I didn't know any, that. We've not gotten any of those leads down yet. I'm a past district governor in this district and I do fully understand. Okay. You said you don't fully understand? I do fully understand, but okay. I'm not sure. That, but I mean, I'm sure everybody's been online and seen where there's been the sign for um, – you know, interested in Rotary, maybe you kind of explain what goes down when somebody hits that button? Yes. So the, the membership leave process starts at RI, right? So we get these individuals that go onto the website and say that they're interested in Rotary. They can be new prospective members. They can be individuals that are actually looking to maybe relocate. Um, and then there are also those that are actually referred to Rotary by someone else. So what we do is we get that information, we filter it on to the districts in that area. Um, once the district leader gets that prospective member, they contact that person to see, you know, what their interests are, and then that's when that information is sent down to the club level, right? So it's sent over to the club leaders with the anticipation of the, club, the district leader saying, hey, this club will be a good fit for you. So once you guys receive that information, um, it's up to you at that point to reach out to the prospective member, that lead that was sent to you to invite them over to your club. So that's, that's a short breakdown of the process. Um, if you guys are interested in seeing like the step-by-step -step process at the club level, there is a webinar that we actually did live that was pretty interesting, um, just showing you um, how to manage an actual lead that comes to your club. I can send that to Linda um, later if you guys want to take a look at that. It's, it's pretty good information. Okay. So just getting back to, uh, if you guys had any questions about membership leads, I'm sorry. No? Okay, no, great. No, we're good. Okay, great. Thank you. So going back to the prospective members, you also want to consider um, those young professionals who have participated in probably um, your Rotary programs, such as uh, the group study exchange or the vocational training team members. You have the ambassadorial scholars, uh, the Rotary Peace Fellow, and then you have the Rotaractors as well. And then you have their parents and the grandparents of interactors of the Rotary um, Youth Exchange students. So there's plenty of individuals um, that could possibly be prospective members. Now we wanna make sure, first of all, if the club is diverse, you wanna make sure that um, it's actually a reflection of what's going on in, in your club. And so since you guys are a new club and you guys just chartered, this is a great way to, um, to figure out what is needed within your club. Have you guys taken the club health check yet? Have you had the opportunity to do that? No. Okay. So the club health check, if you're not aware of it, it is a resource that is like you're going to the doctor, you're seeing 
what is needed from each one of your members and they have the opportunity to say hey we're looking to do this different or we're looking to do this more and you guys have the opportunity to diagnose what's going on within your child and Lacey on the southbound side I'm sorry Linda oh sorry <laughs> no worries um, so I a quick thought yeah. We are an international motorcycling Rotarian e-club meeting online. So our membership oh. isn't necessarily directed at a specific geographical area. We are the world. Okay. So you guys meet online. Okay. Okay. That's fine too. I mean, but so the more individuals you get in there, the, the better, right? And the diversity is still uh, plays a major, um, a major uh, point in, in your club. So the most effective and vibrant clubs tend to reflect the demographics of the communities that they serve. So increasing the number of women, younger professionals and members of various ethnic groups should be every club's goal. Um, clubs that bring together diverse perspective addresses the needs of their communities more creatively. Um, the diverse clubs also have greater credibility in their communities, a wider range of skills, increased um, volunteer resources, um, you have expanded leadership pros uh, prospects and enhanced fundraising potential. So the business profession, the gender balance, and the ethnic makeup is very important. It's also the aging and diversifying your club. There is an actual um, membership tool called the uh, membership assessment. Um, it's a publication has, that has specific tools on how to help you evaluate the diversity within your club. Um, they have tools like diversifying your club and representing your club's profession. It can help club determine if their club demographic mirrors that of their local community in regards to gender, ethnicity, age, and profession. So we do like recommend having a group of members who are devoted to membership, ideally the club membership um, committee. Do you guys have a membership committee yet? We're working on it. Okay. Yes. So taking the action based on the findings, like while you may not see immediate change, taking the membership assessment tool will just um, make you aware of what's needed within the club as far as diversity. And it also strengthen your club and also Rotary. So this is, this is a thing that is pretty interesting. Like because you guys are meeting um, online, and you, you want to make sure that people are perceiving your club a certain way. So since you guys are, are meeting online, what actually are you guys doing to attract new members to bring them in? Um, because they're not actually ever going to meet you face to face. Like what, is, what are you guys doing to attract those individuals? Well, we do meet face to face periodically. Okay. We have different get togethers, rides from different regions of both the U.S. and Canada. Okay. Okay. So it you seems like most members are, are members of other chapters too, are members of other clubs already or have been. Yeah. So that's another interesting dynamic, Diana, is that uh, a bunch of members in this club are considered to be associate members. Oh, okay. Which, okay. Which, we're, which we're classifying as technically honorary members. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> So, 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 for example, you've got four PDGs and an RC on this call, okay. all members of other clubs. Okay, got it, got it, got it, got it. So when no. you guys are... <laughs> but we, right now our club consists of 25 uh, members of the club itself, plus 25 other people associated with the club. Right. So we've got a 50-member base, of which 25 are the... As far as our eyes concerned, the, the legit 25, the act, I don't know. The active members. <laughs> well, as far as the rest of us in the club are concerned, all 50 of us are. Okay? Right. Okay. And, yeah, and exactly. So, and, so the, and so the way we're getting the word out is literally word of mouth. Okay, perfect. And that's great. That's great. If you're, if they're en if you're engaging them that way, that's, that's a good thing. Um, we would just, I don't know, if you, when you guys come together, you meet. Are you inviting prospective members when you guys are actually facing? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Perfect. So when that—that's another thing. Um, when you guys are having those guest prospective members, 
Um, it's easy for a visitor. Is it easy for a visitor to find the basic information about your club? You want to make sure when a visitor arrives that they're actually greeted. Um, I've actually visited a couple of clubs. Um, and to be honest, when I came in, uh, no one met, no one greeted me. I just sat down at a table and it seemed very, what's that, like the clickish type and everybody kind of sat with their own per, uh, personal individual. Let's, let's stop right now, Diane. Do you ride a motorcycle? No, I don't. Do you have an interest in riding a motorcycle? <laughs> My mother would kill me. <laughs> we won't tell her. <laughs> She would kill me. <laughs> Sorry for interrupting. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so it just appeared that it was not um, it was not welcoming. I was not greeted. Um, there was uh, no one that introduced me, and so that it just gives me the the feeling that I wasn't wanted. And so we want to just make sure that when you guys are um, inviting uh, in the prospective members to your club, that it is uh, welcoming. It is. They're engaged and they're not um, sitting alone and no one is actually having conversations with them. And you'll be surprised the many individuals that this has happened to. So we just wanna make sure that that is being, uh, being done. So we wanna ask you like, why you guys feel like membership is a priority? Um, membership is actually declining as we know. Uh, there, there becomes a strain on the membership in the club. Like with less members, there's less service projects and less positive impact on the community. Rotarians are aging out. So having diversity in multiple generations is key in order to carry on the legacy of the club. There are opportunities for new members, but if prospective members don't feel welcome and supported, they'll actually move on. So attracting and engaging members have never been more a, a, a huge um, issue at Rotary right now because individuals are are leaving Rotary within like the first two years of becoming a member, um, and we're we're asking you know individuals are asking like why do they feel like they're moving why are they leaving um, because right. most of them are not engaged they're not they don't feel valued um, they don't want to give that type of time to somewhere that they don't feel valued so it's very important. So in order to bring those individuals back, we got to make sure that, you know, we're not doing the same things. And because um, you guys are meeting mostly online and sometimes in person, um, do you guys have any, have you done any service projects or are planning to do any service projects together? Yeah, we're planning, yes. Okay. It's in the works. Yeah. Linda, that would be great once you guys are um, setting that up, if you want to share uh, that information with me and then I can... Because if you guys are doing anything that is um, the, that on membership and you would like for me to share, once that information is given to me because I'm speaking to individuals at the zone level and also at the district level, I can share that. And so they can, they can send that information out to different districts just to get the word out. So take, you can definitely take advantage of me whenever you feel the opportunity to. Um, so we want to... So we want to just make sure that um, we're, I'm not sure if you guys have talked about um, being flexible yet, like the different membership types. So this, this quote is my favorite. I welcome change as long as nothing is altered or different. <laughs> <laughs> so just talking a little about the council on legislation, um, that is where uh, individuals came together and they were saying, hey, you know, let's take down, take away the Rotary Police or whatever, um, and try to do some different um, things with the club. And so, with as much curiosity that there has been about new flexibility, sometimes there can be just much fear or confusion from club members when exploring new options of flexibility for their club. They kind of get confused about what to do or what not to do. Um, so the different uh, flexibility types. You can have the different membership types. As you said, you guys have associate members. You can have corporate memberships. Um, we've heard of um, family memberships. And so they're all just different ways that the club feel that they want to attract more members. So it's not a um, you can do this or you can't do that. Um, if you guys are interested in corporate memberships or family memberships, I have um, quite a few clubs that are actually 
doing it and are doing very well. And I can um, share with Linda how they set it up and how they um, changed their actual bylaws to fit those uh, membership types. So I can I can see that Linda, if that if that would it be helpful for you. That would be great. Okay, awesome. Diane, I've got a question for you, if I may. Sure. How is Rotary International looking at uh, the changing demographic, you know, predominantly in the U.S. at least, with, uh, with a lot of Latinx influence, and how do we address the, the future of the cultural makeup of the U.S.? How do we get involved? So that is a great question. So um, the incoming president is actually going to be addressing that at the International Assembly this year. Um, so I don't want to spill the beans on it. So, um, it is going to be something worth listening to and worth hearing. And um, if you guys are not able to attend um, the International Assembly, it is going to be something that's recorded. So you'll be able to, to get that information. So yeah, he has a lot of um, ideas and changes that are about to come, come our way. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, So just talking a little bit about the um, flexibility um, in meeting frequency format and we want to determine the best day and time for meetings. Um, if you guys have the option of changing or canceling a meeting if, um, if the need arises, you can do that. Um, you want to count service projects or social events as meetings, you can do that. Um, you can choose whether to gather in person, online, or alternate between online and in-person meetings or even using both formats at the same time. For like an example, a member could participate in an in-person meeting online through like a video chat. And they have that on like social media or just like the Zoom that we're doing now. Um, so it doesn't have to be every meeting has to be a sit down meeting or online meeting, whichever you want to, you prefer, you can be very flexible in that. Um, and in, in, when you're doing so with your meeting flexibility, you want to make sure that you do amend your bylaws to either relax or heighten the attendance requirements and policies of terminating members or for poor attendance. We guys have that um, written down. And we already talked about the different membership types and I'm actually going to send over um, to Linda to share um, with you guys just to see what other clubs are doing. And you can also um, go on to, uh, if I'm hopefully, hopefully, I'm sure you guys are all on my rotary. Um, but we have something called the Membership Best Practices. And there in the Membership Best Practices, there are tons of discussions that happen there um, from different club leaders, district leaders, zone leaders, um, on corporate membership, family memberships. They talk about um, the demographics that, that was just brought up. Um, so you can just do like a search for whatever topic you're looking for and you'll find it there. Or if you want to start your own conversation, you can start your own group um, membership best practice and put that information in, in there. And you'll be surprised how many people um, respond and give their feedback to that. So it's just really simple, guys. Like when you guys are um, to attract new members or um, to engage new members, you want to make sure that you're keeping it simple that the atmosphere is welcome and engaging, um, it's happy, it's fun. Um, of course, you still wanna do the business side of it, um, but in order to, to keep individuals engaged, we have to switch things up. It can't be the same Rotary Club that people are used to hearing or have heard about Rotary before. And then you have to actually make sure that it's, it is something that they will value. So they have to see what's in it for them so that they're actually gonna come back and visit your club and actually join. So I have um, this, what I call the membership resource guide. And I'm not sure if you guys have seen this before. Um, it's about four pages and it has every single um, resource that we have. And then it gives you a very brief description of each one. And then as you can see on the, the right side of where it says available, you're actually able to click on the link of each publication and it'll take you to that actual publication if you want to print it or um, purchase it from um, Shop Rotary. So this is something if you, I, I'll actually send Linda as well so that every one of you guys can have it because it's a great piece of information 
if you're ever looking to have a discussion. The webinars are on here as well that you'll be able to find that I talked about earlier. Um, and so it's just a great tool to have. Um, so if there's are any more any discussion questions for me, I'm free to answer it. That's it. <laughs> Sounds good. It's good information. Uh, I can show one other conversation as well if you guys want to have it. Sure, I bet Linda could distribute that for us. Yeah. Something else I was going to mention, you know, correct me the rest of you if I'm wrong, but is everybody here or has everybody here come to Rotary through a physical club instead of the E club? No. I came okay. through the E club. Okay. How did you hear about it, Harold? Through another Rotarian, through uh, Terry. I was actually uh, a Colonian. <laughs> Well, that's just Greek for rotary, so that's fine. Yeah, I jumped ship. <laughs> I got smart. I, I still think the uh, fellowship of motorcycle rotarians would be continue to be a good source. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I, I agree with that. You combine you combine that power along with what we are doing, and you're going to raise the level of interest every time we go on rides in different states that we haven't heretofore been to. Absolutely. Maybe we should be talking to some of these presidents in states that might have a little more sunshine and see what they, if they're willing to put, if we send them a package with a you know, our, or just send them the online address with our information and see if they wouldn't uh, put on a five-minute talk in their clubs about those who have motorcycles. Take a look at this. South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, just saying. New Mexico, Arizona. Yeah, something else I'll throw out there. Jerry, uh, your, your trip was mostly a function of your local club, right? Uh, not at all. <laughs> it was okay because no, that I, kind of thing. My um, uh, my involvement on my trip came back through um, uh, uh, <clears throat> my involvement at the district level, uh, primarily through project that was particularly done by our district level at a uh, with a three H grant, a hundred fifty five thousand dollars three H grant, which I participated in. But a number of clubs participated in, primarily the Rochester Rotary Club in our district. The support of this particular clinic that I did and put together was, um, had involvement, as much involvement from cl this club as any of the clubs. Probably eight or nine different clubs supported the, cl uh, the, the whole clinic. So it was a multi-club thing. Nice. I was kind of thinking about what's the... Uh... And I, this is so millennial, which is way younger than me anyhow. But if you want to make the pitch that Rotary is about that kind of international service and adventure, is there some kind of a social media friendly report that comes out of it that then goes out on Facebook or some other channel for people who are looking for some more adventure in their life and something to feel altruistic about? How do we make that pitch? You know, how do we show, hey, this is the adventure and it comes from Rotary, including the club? Facebook. I think fundamentally we're still learning who we are as a club and what things we're going to be involved with the long term. We need to be putting an effort into our structure, which Linda's been trying to put together with uh, getting us all on committees. And one of those things is is what what are the things we're going to accomplish as a club together? And Do you think the YouTube channel the would be a good place together, to? Yeah. Then we've got something more to advertise beyond, you know, just our common interest in motorcycles. Right. The um, it's Amanda. been slow going, but on the other hand, I've I've noticed, the, you know, I've helped start six clubs, and those that have been slow about it and slowly developed are still going, <laughs> and those that rushed into it uh, are not. <laughs> so. We could try out something like, you know, a YouTube channel, and then you're not tied to Facebook, but you, you show stories about some of the trips, whether they're domestic motorcycle trips, some of us getting together, 
I mean, already, you know, Linda's got the YouTube videos up there for the meetings, but yeah. that could be interspersed with ride videos That'd or be good. mission trip videos. Yep. All the marketing. <laughs> Indeed. And that, that standing offer is out there for any of you. Diana, I've been kind of crashing your presentation a little bit with showing overviews of the Bay Area here from up in the hills. But um, if any of you want to come out here, it'd be a good opportunity to do some, you know, we could do a little media splash with it. Um, certainly for an ego piece, because the older we get, the faster we were, right? <laughs> but also maybe to... Um, to help build that that sense of what's possible through Rotary to the, the family, the, the, the relationships across geography. Anybody have any more questions for Diana? No, thanks for the presentation. Good information. Yeah, yeah I'm good. I thought it was good presentation. Thank you, Diana. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. I really do. Very informative and refreshing. <laughs> Are you, in, are you in Chicago, Diana? I am. I am in Chicago. Um, so oh. the uh, oh. office is in Evanston. So it takes me like an hour and a half to get to to the office every day. <laughs> how, how cold is the uh, weather there? You know what? It's actually warm today. It's 43 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's above 40, you can send it our way. If it's not above 40, you keep that crap, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I understand. We had like 20 degrees like two days ago. So see the bike says it's 68 up here on the other. <laughs> oh, you, he's bragging. <laughs> you won't be riding a bike today. So it's pretty much perfect riding. I'm just trying to hook Wait, anybody you... wants to come out and visit me, you know. <laughs> Diana, are you a member of Rotary? Morning. I'm sorry. Are you a Rotary member? So not. Yeah, so you know what? There's like policies and procedures with that as just like an uh, employee. Um, and so that is actually supposed to be changing also. Um, that as an actual employee that you're able to become, is really able to become a Rotarian if you are at the manager level. So. Huh. Hopefully that's changing. We won't tell anybody, just like we won't tell any mother, any mo your mother about your love of motorcycles. She will die. <laughs> <laughs> mom, I joined a motorcycle club. <laughs> I, I couldn't even. You you would kill my mom. <laughs> we'll kill her. We'll just tell her. Get any tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. You, he's a, the a problem, I see. <laughs> I doubt you're going to find a more fun club. <laughs> hey, Jerry, do I detect a road trip? <laughs> to Chicago? Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah, come to Chicago. Summertime. In the, in the, exactly, exactly, absolutely in the summertime. <laughs> yeah. There's a couple of us that have Cadillac motorcycles, you know, Winnebago motorcycles, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're yellow. <laughs> Oh, no, they're not. The question I just read. We need to get Diana's me. mother to join the motorcycling Rotarians. <laughs> there you go. That's a great idea. <laughs> Think it's going to happen? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I'm, she's, she's, I'm about to call her right now so I got the phone with you guys. But thank you guys so much. Linda, I'll be sending you a lot of information tomorrow, so look out for that. Perfect. Thank you. If you guys ever need me, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a good night. Everybody see Amanda's chat? We have a goal. <laughs> Diana's mother for Rotary. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. <laughs> Maybe she'll share her motorcycle with you. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Let's Bye make guys. sure you... <laughs> good night. Bye. Later. See you, guys. Good Bye. Night, all. Good night. <laughs>